God bless you, Pastor McGraw, Lady McGraw, and to all clergy, family, and friends of the First Bible Church of the Lord's Mission. I count it an honor and a joy to be here before you today. It is something that I do not take lightly, and I thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. We are going to just explore the word, just like First Lady McGraw said. We're going to take our time with a passage. Um, I remember Pastor Woodhouse, as she taught us, line upon line, precept upon precept, and that's exactly what we are going to do today. So please turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And I'm going to be using the New Living Translation Bible. And because there's a big chunk that I want to go through, um, I promise it will still be within your half hour limits. But because there is a chunk that I want to go through, um, I ask that if you have a uh, translator on your phone that can open up the Bible app in the New Living Translation, I ask that you open it in that translation, please. Because I believe that that, translation just breaks it down in a way that makes more sense to us. God bless you. If you just joined the line, I ask if you can please mute so that everyone can hear and we don't hear you rummaging around. God bless you. The title of this message is going to be Make Room for Him. Make Room for Him. And it's a simple message, but I pray that you see something in this passage that you've never seen before. So once again, I'm in 2 Kings chapter 4, and I'm going to begin at the eighth verse. And this is a story of Elisha and the Shunem woman. This story takes that takes place in 2 Kings chapter 4, I believe is a parallel of how God wants to operate and move through us if we are willing to be as obedient and humble as the, the Shunem woman was. So I'm going to make a parallel between what God wants to do to us and what he did through her. So once again, that's 2 Kings chapter 4, and I'm going to begin at verse 8, and it reads, One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. So keep, keep your finger right there for a minute. I'm going to stop, okay? Let's stop right there for just a second because here you have Elisha, a prophet of God. He worked many miracles and he's traveling to and fro to do the work of the Lord. The first thing that I want to point out to you is that whenever you are doing the work of the Lord, God will make sure that you are taken care of. So never be afraid to do what God is leading you to do because if he led, it, if he led you to do it, He's going to make sure that provision is made and that he's taking care of you while you are doing the work. So in verse eight, there's a woman. And I love how the woman, how the Bible says that the woman was wealthy. Now, most wealthy people, they don't have a need because money gets them just about everything that they want. Right. Well, just about. Right. This wealthy woman urges Elisha to come to her home to eat. So what is she doing? She is feeding him out of the kindness of her heart. She is taking care of the man of God. She's providing something that Elisha needs to provide. Did she have to? No. But whenever Elisha came by, he would stop there and he was able to be, to be refreshed. He was able to get a meal. So imagine if we gave God out of our wealthy place, not because we had to, but because we wanted to. Imagine if we gave out of our abundance. Now, the first thing that our minds will think of is money, but I'm not talking about money. In fact, in the story here where the Shunem, the Shunem woman is literally giving food. Now, you can take care of the man of God in, in you know, your life, Pastor McGraw, First Lady McGraw, and you can take care of other people that God may lead you to bless with a financial gift, but your wealthy place is not only money. Your wealthy place can be your time, your wealthy place can be extra clothes that, that you have. Your wealthy place can be a talent or something that you can make or do. But the challenge is for you to identify what that place is and identify that everybody has something to give. And so this wealthy woman, the Shunem woman, gave it. She gave it from her heart. She did not give it because she was in need. She did not give it because she needed a miracle, like the woman with the pot of oil. And that was all that she had. 
She didn't give it because she was up against the wall and needed a miracle or she was in distress. She gave it because she wanted to. And because she was willfully willing to give unto the man of God as a result of her, her willingness, there's a series of events that take place in her life and she is blessed for years to come. And there's a lesson that we can learn for that from that. So let's dive a little bit deeper so we can see what is actually going on with her. So we know that she is wealthy and we know that she feeds Elisha whenever he passes by. Let's look at verse nine. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him with a roof and furnish it. Remember that word, furnish it with a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. So now the wealthy woman takes it a step further. Not only does she um, feed Elijah whenever he passes by, but she makes a room and she furnishes the room and she convinces her husband to make this room for the man of God. And it's not just any room. It has a bed, it has a table, it has a chair, and it has a lamp. Now think about your life. We may not have everything we want, but I am confident enough to say that everyone on this line, that I, I believe everyone on this line has everything that we need. And we thank God for it. But have we truly made room for God to work in our lives? Many of us have made the room when we come to church and you know we do certain things here and there, but have we furnished that room? Have we given God a bed, a place to rest in us, a table, a place where we can study deeper in him, a chair where we can sit when times get rough in him, a lamp where we can allow him to illuminate the dark places in our lives. We often think of making a room as just going to church and singing in the choir, or ushering on the usher board and all those things are fine and well and dandy and they have their place. And I'm not knocking that, but God wants to dwell in all areas of our lives. He wants a relationship with you. He wants a room and to be able to fully move through you in the way that he chooses. And it's not just a Sunday thing or a midweek thing. It's an every day, every second, every minute, every hour thing where he can lead you and guide you, where he wants you to put um, him first in his life. It's like putting things first and making sure that he's first in your life, right? Because uh, you could be at the airport and you can still miss the flight, right? So we don't want to be in church and still miss the flight. I'm going to pause right there for a second. Say that one more time. You don't want to be in church and still miss the flight, okay? And the Shunem woman, she gave from what she had willfully. She makes this room for Elijah, and now she has this place where, where he can dwell, the man of God can dwell. And if you just join them, so, um, coming from um, 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, and she she makes this place where he could dwell. And it's the, the story is interesting because first she starts by feeding the man of God. Then she gets a little bit further and she makes a room. She furnishes this room. But now because of what she has done, she stands in, in a position where God is going to bless her. So let's look at verse 11. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak with her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Keep your finger right there. I'm sorry I keep stopping, but there's, there's revelation I want, I want to get right here. Or, or that I've gotten that I want to share. The Shunem woman does not ask for a miracle. In fact, she states that she is well taken care of. But how many of you know that even when we say that we do not have a need, God knows the hidden desires of our heart. He knows those things that we desire. And if we delight ourselves with him, he will give us those desires of our heart. And this is a perfect example. She delighted in doing what she did for the man of God. She delighted in feeding him. She delighted in making room for him. And now she gets that hidden desire of her heart. Verse 14, later, Elijah asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, 
she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Verse 15, call her again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her, as she stood in the doorway, no, she didn't even make it in the room. She just gets to the doorway and she is blessed. Verse 16, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arm. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. Verse 17, but sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that, at that time, the following year, she had a son just as Elisha had said. So as a result of her willingness, she is blessed with a son. That hidden desire of her heart is granted. That very thing that she gave up on is the thing that she was blessed with. God has a way of blessing us when we make room for him and delight in him. When we give of our wealthy place, of our heart to him, it doesn't mean that there won't be challenges. It doesn't mean that there won't be trials. It doesn't mean that things won't go wrong. But because you did it willfully, because you put him first, because you honored him, God always makes sure that you are taken care of. God will always make sure that you are taken care of. And yes, it may not always be easy. And the enemy is going to rear his head, but God is going to make sure that you're going to be okay. Let's look further. Verse 18. One day when her child was old, older, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried, my head hurts, my head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. Verse 20. So the servant took him home and his mother held him on her lap, but around noontime, he died. Verse 21. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. So she technically, she takes the, the blessing that God blessed her with and she puts it in the room that she made for, for him. Then shut the door and left him there. What has God blessed you with that the enemy has challenged you and you need to give it back to God and shut the door and leave it there? Food for thought. Verse 22, she sent a message to her husband. Send one of the servants with a donkey so that I can, carry, I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. 23. Why go today, he asked. It is neither a new moon nor a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. Now her husband does not even know that her son, their son, is dead. And she confesses without him knowing the severity of the issue. Remember, he knows that the son just has a headache. So he doesn't know how severe the issue is. But she confesses to, to the husband, it will be all right. 24. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance and said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you and your husband and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. So she confesses again that everything is fine when honestly it is not. So notice how she confessed to her husband, it will be all right. And she confessed to Elijah's servant, Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she gets to Elijah, Elisha, her confession changes. Verse 27. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not revealed, has not told me what it is. Verse 28, then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Did I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Verse 29, then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. Verse 30. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home until you go with me. So Elisha returned with him. 
Now that right there reminds me of, I won't let go until you bless me. But that's a whole nother thing. Verse 31, Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. Verse 32, when Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, laying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Verse 35, Elisha got up walked back and forth across the room once and then stretched out himself again on the child. This time, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. Verse 37, she fell at his feet, at his feet, and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. She took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Now notice how the Shunem woman tells Gehazi, the servant, that everything is fine. Then she tell, and she also tells her servant that her servant, I'm sorry, she tells the servant Gehazi that everything is fine, and she tells her husband that it will be well. But to the man of God, Elisha, she confesses her heart. And we have to be like that sometimes. Sometimes we have to confess to others everything is fine and all will be well, but we truly have to tell God how we are feeling. Why is that? Because people will discourage you. They will throw pity parties with you and for you. They will talk about you and then thank God for Jesus or at the same time. But no, you have to know how to tell God what is going on with you because he already knows the truth anyway, and he's already preparing a way for you. He's just waiting for you to come to him. So I want to challenge us today to look at this chapter more closely and to learn um, from this lesson about the Shunem woman, because many of us are just like, us, like her. We have had our miracle. We have been challenged with the very thing that God blessed us with. We have experienced many victories in God. And there are times when we just have to bite our tongue. Like she said in verse 26, everything is fine. And there will be times when we have to give it to God and shut the door and petition for him to answer. The Shunem woman's confession was key. She didn't give up on her faith. She didn't throw in the towel. She did not allow others to place doubt in her ears. She believed God. And as a result of her believing God, her son is healed. But check this out. How did this whole thing happen? Her son is healed in the very room she made for the man of God. I'm going to say that again. Her son is healed in the very room she made for the man of God. He is healed lying on the very bed she made for the man of God. So when we make room for God, when we delight in him, in the very thing that, that he desires from us, we, when we willfully give it to him, he will make sure that that is the place that he will bless us. He will resurrect those dead areas in our lives, whatever it may be. And just as a result of our willingness and obedience um, to him, we will be blessed just as the Shunem woman was blessed. And again, that doesn't mean that it will be easy. It doesn't mean that we won't face challenges. But if God is for us, who can be against us? So notice the Shunem woman takes the boy out of the room, right? after the boy is healed and she takes him back downstairs. So after the miracle of him coming back to life, she still leaves the room for the man of God. She does not occupy the room once the boy is healed, she leaves the room. So are we still leaving room for God after our miracle? Are we still leaving the room for him after we get what we want, after he answers our prayers, after he performs the miracle, are we still making room for him or are we just leaving or um, worse, occupying the room? But wait, let me take you back. How did this all start? It started with her taking care of the man of God. 
She took care of the things of God. She made room for him. She fed the man of God and in return, she was blessed. Now we don't have time to go into the whole story, but this is not the last time that you see the Shunem woman after her son is killed. You see her again in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse, um, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 8. You see her again in 2 Kings chapter 8. There is a famine that comes to the land for seven years. Elisha warns the Shunem woman of the famine, and she's instructed to leave in order to be protected in the famine. So she leaves and she goes to the land of the Philistines for seven years until the famine was over. So she was warned of the famine to come. So not only when the famine was over, not only that, when she came back um, to Israel, the king restored her land and her crops that she had lost possession of during the time that she was gone during that seven years. And the king does this because he heard of how she took care of Elijah and how Elisha had brought her son back to life. So you really have to read 2 Kings chapter eight because it gives the full story in, in the full context of all of the things that she was blessed with even after the healing of her son. And God is so miraculous because he has everything set up for her. When she returns back from the land to Israel, her name was being mentioned by the king in the room at the very time that she was walking in to ask for her land. So God will have your name mentioned, mentioned in rooms that you never thought of. He will have provision and restoration for you that you never thought that you would never regain. He will take care of you and forewarn you of the dangers like he did with her in the famine if we just make room for him. So imagine if she had never gave from her wealthy place. Imagine if she didn't put first things first. Imagine if she never fed Elisha the meals or made a room for him. She would have never experienced the birth of her son, that's one. She would have never experienced the miracle of him coming back to life. She would have never been forewarned of the famine. She would have never had um, the crops in the land restored to her after the famine. So there is a blessing that is beyond measure in doing what God has for you. There is a blessing beyond measure in delighting yourself in the Lord and putting first things first. So what can you do to make God smile? What can you do from your heart to better the kingdom? Simple acts of obedience can save you from destruction. It will keep you in his protection and in his perfect will. This past year, we have all been challenged in our faith. We have experienced trauma and it has affect, affected our lives. And it's a normal reaction to want to draw back and kind of go into a turtle shell when traumatic, traumatic things happen. But now it's time to hit the ground running. It's time to draw in souls to Christ. It's time to, to draw in those family members and loved ones to Christ. It's time to share the good news of the gospel. It's time to make room for a deeper prayer life and a deeper Bible study life. It's time to serve. And not only in church, we have a tendency to serve amongst ourselves, but the word, the world needs you. The world needs the word that is inside of you. The world needs your wealthy place. And remember that wealthy place, as we said in the beginning, is not always money. The world needs your knowledge, your wisdom, the lessons that you learned from the divorce, from the miscarriage, from that wayward child that got saved. God needs to move through you. So tell your story of how he kept you in the storm. Tell your story of how he brought you out. Tell your story of how you've been delivered. Tell it, do it, speak it, write it, make room for him and furnish that room. Watch your confessions like the Shunem woman. Speak life and not death. Tell God your problems and watch him take care of you. These are all lessons that we can learn from the Shunem woman. And I pray that we take these lessons and do what God has to do um, through us without any further delay. So I just want to say this prayer. God, we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us, but you constantly provide for us and you constantly make ways for us. Now, Lord, if you have made a room for us and you have died on the cross, help us, God, to make bigger room 
for you. Help us to do what you have called for us to do. Help us to give from our wealthy place, our broken place, our wounded place, God. Help us, Lord God, to, to say what you would have us to say and to go with you where you would have us to go. Let us know, Lord God, that we have multiple gifts, talents, and abilities, knowledge, and wisdom to be used for your glory and for your kingdom, Lord God. Help us not to be in the airport, God, and still miss the flight, Lord God. Place a fire in our hearts like never before. We are quick to say the world is becoming darker, but let us also say that our fire is burning brighter for you, God. Let your anointing in us be stronger than ever before in the name of Jesus. Fill us again, God. Stir up the anointing and the gifts that lie within us. Convict our hearts that it will be less about just coming to church, but more about what we are doing for your kingdom. Help us to be reminded of who we are in you. Help us to be reminded of the sacrifice that you made for us. Help us to remember that you did not die on the cross for us to be defeated. You did not die on the cross for us to give up when times are rough. Help us to remember that there is a purpose and a plan for our lives. Help us to remember that this is not the end, but this is only the beginning and you have invested so much in us. So help us to know that you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. Help us to remember that every giant that we face in the name of Jesus, that you are there with us. Even when the situation looks dead, Lord God, help us to know that you can bring it back to life. Thank you, God, for knowing those inner intricate places of our heart, God, those inner desires and needs that no one else knows. And you have blessed us, God, just like the Shunem woman, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you will lead us and guide us, Lord God, in all truth for your word is true. Father, I ask that you bless all those on this line, Lord God, all those with the need that only you know, Lord God. Touch every person, Lord God, that is in need in the name of Jesus. And we thank you that as we draw nigh to you, as we make room for you, Lord God, that you will meet us there. And we don't do it because of any other reason, but because we love you. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.